Um, so this is a combination of, I think, about four one-hour presentations, and I'm going to try and do it in about 10 minutes. You might notice that I have too many projects, but I also have too many slides. I've got 164 to be exact. Um, so we're going to go through it rather quickly. Um, so the first thing I want to say is I'm talking about stuff that isn't just me that has developed it. In fact, I've done very little of the development, I just get to talk about it. Um, and so all these people and plenty more have done most of the actual hard work. Um, and because I have too many projects, I'd really love your help because I'd like to like get some sleep sometime as well. Um, so yes, this is my plea to help me. Um, so hi, I'm Tim. And I like to attend conferences like LatchUp, but you might notice from my accent that I'm not a local. Um, I come from Australia, and this is where Australia is located on the world map. Um, it's not near anything in particular. It is also quite large in size, and I'm a human, and I'm very lazy, and travel is actually kind of hard. Um, and especially when you have to get on a plane for 13 plus hours to go anywhere. Um, and so we've developed this great worldwide technology called high speed internet. And I was like, is there a way to get to conferences without getting to conferences? And so I started a project to do that. Um, this is kind of the root of all this stuff, this Tim videos project. Um, and I wanted to record conferences so that I could view them remotely. Um, and this is kind of the setup that you use to record a conference. And in fact, it's been used somewhat here to record this conference. Um, you can see that it takes quite a few things. Um, but one important part is being able to get a nice digital capture of the slides because technical conferences especially put lots of detail on their slides. And if you just point a camera at the projector, you can't read any of the text because people are terrible at putting text that's big enough. Um, and so we needed these boxes to record this, but we couldn't find anything that was reliable and easy enough to use that we could give it to volunteers at conferences to run without having lots of AV experts. Um, and then I came across this project. Um, this project is called the NETV. Um, it basically does a man in the middle on the HDMI protocol and allows you to overlay over top of a encrypted HDMI stream um, some video. And that was pretty cool. And I was thinking maybe I could use this. Um, but it was explicitly designed to not allow capture. Um, and what I wanted to do was capture. Um, so I thought about it and I thought maybe I could bend this in a way that it was totally not meant to do. But um, like this. Um, but the problem is that NETV is a piece of hardware and I'm a software developer. And this is kind of what software developers deal with. It's in like bits and glowy things and all that type of stuff. Um, and this is what software looks like in theory. But if you look really, really closely, this is what it looks like in practice. Um, and there are a lot of bugs. And sometimes they're really big bugs. But it doesn't matter in software because you can patch it after the fact. And then it's like the bugs never existed in the first place. Um, and so um, hardware is a bit different. It's very, very hard to patch. And so I don't like hardware um, because I'm a human and I write lots of bugs. Um, but the NETV had a secret thing inside of it. It had a thing called an FPGA. And the great thing about an FPGA is that it turns hardware into software, and I'm a software developer. So all of a sudden, this started to sound more doable. Um, so like, I love FPGAs because, as I said, I'm a software developer. And I've done PHP, and PHP is a horrible language, and um, I was able to make it do anything. And so I thought, how hard could this be? Um, 
And so I started this HDMI to USB project to basically build hardware for presentation capture based around FPGA because I'm a software developer and I don't want to deal with hardware. Um, and I was like, well, FPGAs uh, have software on them. How bad could programming for an FPGA be? Um, and you might notice this is past, Tim. Um, and then I discovered that the way you program an FPGA is two languages. One is called Verilog and one is called VHDL. And after spending a whole bunch of time working with them, um, my face kind of looked like this. Um, we had some firmware for this hardware that kind of worked. It had some basic features, but there are a lot of features that um, did not work yet. And there was also kind of a complicated licensing problem because we were using stuff generated from the vendors. And it's questionable whether you can actually release that. Um, and then we created another piece of hardware and ran into the problem that now we had to support two boards. And this was increasingly becoming frustrating and hard and was making me sad. Um, and then I discovered this thing called MeGen. And MeGen is interesting in that it's a Python-based HDL. And I'm a software developer. I do a lot of developing in Python. And I thought Python is really awesome. But Python is considered to be a long way away from hardware, um, pretty much as far as you could possibly get. So I wasn't quite sure this was the right solution. And I didn't have any time. So I thought, why not try Python, but get an expert to do it? And so I worked with a guy called Android Digital to basically implement the same functionality that had taken three years for us to develop, and he rewrote it in four weeks with a lot more features. Um, it had like triple buffering video, it had support for multiple boards, it had a soft CPU, it had Ethernet support, um, and so we actually finally had open source hardware and firmware to capture. Um, and it was truly open source because it didn't use any vendor IP. And we've used it now to record conferences around the world, including the one that you're currently at, um, which is pretty awesome. Um, and now um, it turns out that Bunny, who developed the original NETV, wanted to do a new project called the NETV2. And the stuff we've developed for the HDMI USB is now being used in the NETV2 project. Um, so that's also pretty cool. So the question you probably have for me is, how did you do this? And how can I do the same? How can I take my three-year project and make it a four-week project? Um, and as I said, MeGen is Python, not Verilog or VHDL, but you still need hardware understanding to write it. It doesn't take Python and convert your random Python program into HDL. It's just a better way of describing your hardware. Um, and the reason why Python makes a lot of sense is Python is a very powerful and productive language, and it's also a great glue language that you use to connect things together. And when you're building hardware, what you're really doing is programming. And Python is designed to be a programming language, not a hardware description language. And you are programming when you're doing um, hardware development for an FPGA. Um, so Python is a really important part of this. Um, but as I said, with Python, you're still writing hardware, and hardware is hard to do. So my simple solution is do less of it. By using a soft CPU, um, which Litex gives you a choice of soft CPU, including a bunch of RISC-V cores, I believe there are four alternatives now, um, you do less in the FPGA. And C code is significantly easier to write than hardware. And most of the system isn't performance critical. We have a console that lets you like log in and change a bunch of configuration options. That's all written in C instead of Verilog and VHDL. And you can like use printf. And printf is so much easier to use than 
you know, flash an LED five times when there's an error. Um, so that is another huge advantage that MeGen gets, is that you only need to write the hardware that is performance critical, everything else you write in a higher level language, um, which makes you a lot more productive. Um, but debugging hardware is still hard, and this is another superpower that MeGen has, is if you want to increase the inspectability of what's going inside the FPGA so you can understand when things are going wrong. And so if you look inside a MeGen or MeSoc based system, you'll find that there's kind of a CPU, there's a wishbone bus, a bunch of peripherals, and you've got your memory and all that type of thing. Um, but most of the time you're just writing your peripherals because all the other stuff has already been done. And so you want to figure out how you can see inside the system. And it turns out that you have a really powerful computer on, when you're developing um, on your desk. And so what you want to do is be able to increase inspectability by making your computer the CPU that's actually inside the FPGA. And so MeGen, Bill, and Litex have this bridge infrastructure which effectively allows a desktop computer to issue requests directly onto the wishbone bus and read and write things like registers, memory regions, all stuff like that. Um, and the bridge is very generic. It supports writing and reading over UART, Ethernet, PCI Express, and thanks to some work Sean done, you can now go over USB. Um, and he has debugged the USB stack over USB while developing USB. Um, and this is really, really powerful. Um, because it's now on a computer, you can have a Python console where you open a connection to the Wishbone bridge and you can write out, write directly into or read from the memory inside your FPGA or the registers. Um, and this is really cool. You can print like the memory map. Um, but even cooler, you get all the things you normally get with Python, like you can bring up IPython, which gives you tab complete, and awesome things like this, which tell you like the symbolic names of all your registers, so you don't even have to remember where everything is. And so this is really awesome and speeds up your debugging substantially. Um, but that's still not enough because FPGA toolchains are really slow, and the reason they're slow is they solve hard problems. And so the solution to that is to put less hardware into the FPGA. Um, these slides are out of order, sorry. Um, and so more compile code means slower compile. So how can we have less hardware in the FPGA? Um, well, first, you can use the LiteX stuff, which is significantly more efficient. Um, this is something from Bunny's project where his original design just had DDR3 and debug, and you can see that the FPGA is almost totally full, but by using the LiteX um, existing cores, you can see the FPGA not only has a significantly large number of features, um, but it's like still practically empty. These are the same side FPGAs. Um, these slides are, sorry, out of order. Um, but we go back to what's inside the FPGA. You don't actually need a lot of the stuff in the FPGA because when you're debugging a peripheral, you just need the peripheral. So why don't we eliminate all the other stuff in the FPGA and just include the bridge and the peripheral you're currently working on? And so once you do that, the compile time is significantly smaller because you only have like one peripheral, which means just FPGA is like 2% utilized and FPGA tooling is then much, much faster. And so this is another power that LiteX and MeGen have that enable you to very quickly do development. Um, The problem that this adds, though, is that we're using a soft CPU now. You need things like a compiler toolchain and a libc and stuff like that. Um, 
So you don't get that for free. That is some extra complexity. Um, so I created a system called Litex Build Env, which basically provides you the complete Python cross compiler firmware and board programming environment. Um, I built this for the HDMI USB system, but it's now been used for a bunch of other things. Um, it supports bare metal um, firmware, it supports Linux, um, it supports Zephyr, and it supports a huge number of boards. Um, here's one, it's the Mimus, it costs about 50 bucks, um, it's Python 6 based. Um, we also support like the RT, which you might already have. Um, we support teeny boards like the tiny FPGA BX, which has an ICE40 and a completely open source toolchain. Um, this is another ICE40 based board and another ICE40 based board. And we support the icebreaker, which Eston um, did, which I highly recommend as a way to get into it, um, FPGA development. And we also support the Tomu FPGA, which I'll talk about again in a little bit. Um, and it's very, very easy to add your own board to this. If you've got a Lattice-based system or Spartan or an Artex, it's very, very easy to add your board to this build environment and it gets you the full cross-compiler and all these type of things you need. Um, but the question is, what are you running on the soft CPU? Um, maybe you're not a C programmer. Why don't we put Python on there, and you're like, well, Python doesn't fit in something as small as a soft CPU running on an FPGA, and then this guy called Damien created a thing called MicroPython, which is a tiny Python that fits on a soft CPU. And so now I also have this project called Foopy, which is Python describing the hardware using MeGen running MicroPython on it. And it's all using the Litex build env. Um, so you've got Python there, and Python there, and Python everywhere. Um, so Litex build env basically makes a Litex easy to set up and get going really quickly. And if you're at the thing on Friday, you probably went through one of the tutorials to um, get started with this development. Um, but we need your help. And my general policy is if you send me pull requests or like contribute to the uh, community in some way. It doesn't matter whether it's documentation, helping people on IRC, you know, anything, I will send you hardware. Um, and so that's the kind of story of Python, but it doesn't stop there. Um, we also have Linux support, which is pretty cool, um, because Linux has lots of developers, and um, the more developers I can trick into doing my projects, the better. Um, and we have working both Open Risk one k and Vex Risk v support. Um, but there's still a lot left to do, and so I would love your help with that. Um, but the thing with the Litex build env, the thing I discovered was it was very easy to make everything easy to set up apart from the FPGA tool chains. And this bugged me. And so now I'm going on further yak shave with this project called SimbiFlow. SimbiFlow, basically, if you take the EDA tooling ecosystem, it's a Verilog to Bitstream system without needing to use any vendor tooling. Um, and we kind of think of it as the GCC for FPGAs. And what I mean by that is not we're not taking C++ and C and converting it into Verilog. We're just building a fully open source free, cross-platform, multi-platform, pluggable, interchangeable system for developing for FPGAs. Um, and this is kind of what the SimbiFlow tool suite looks like. We have Bitstream documentation, which you need if you're going to target hardware. Um, we have place and route tools. We have synthesis tools. And we have documentation and description which feeds all the other parts so that you can get by and understand how everything works. And so at the moment, we have um, three projects that are doing uh, Bitstream documentation. There's iStorm, which covers the ICE40. There's X-Ray, which covers the Series 7 
series from Xilex, and there's Trellis, which covers the ECB5 series from Lattice. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of um, support now. This is the one that um, I've been most actively involved with. This is what the inside of an RTX 750T looks like. All this stuff in green is stuff we 100% understand. And this is kind of a picture of some of the slices, and as you can see, 100% understanding of those. Um, and so this gives you a summary of what we understand. We still have a bunch of work to do on the Series 7 stuff, so would love your help, but we have all the basic tiles. We have enough to do kind of an IoT level SOC. It's not really ready for people who want to just use it, but if you're interested in helping develop, we would love your help. Um, and maybe you want to start your own documentation project for some bitstream that you care about, um, say Spartan 6 or Spartan 3. There's plenty of those boards around. Or we don't have anybody working on Altera slash Intel parts at all now. Um, but the problem is once you have the bitstream, you still need the tooling to do mapping and synthesis. Um, and that's also coming along really well. Um, we could use your help there. And the thing I want to really iterate is that if you have time, I'm pretty sure I can find a way for you to help this effort. Um, if you know Python, as you know, um, pretty much everything is written in Python. Um, if you know C++, a lot of the like synthesis and place and route tools are written in C++. We'd love your help there. Um, if you know Tickle, a lot of the proprietary systems which we do have to interface with um, use Tickle, and I'm not learning Tickle, so I'd love your help there. Um, if you know Verilog, a lot of the models that we have to develop are written in Verilog, and so we'd love your help there. Um, if you know XML, um, we'd love your help there. Um, XML is not a great language to work with, but it is very powerful. Um, if you know English, which hopefully you do, because otherwise you're very bored at the moment, um, you can help by just writing documentation or tutorials or going through the testing. So if there you have time to contribute, um, I will find you something to do. So um, don't stand next to me for too long if you don't want something to do. Um, this is kind of a links to where you can find more information. Um, feel free to email me. Um, if I don't get back to you within 24 hours, email me again. Um, and I also wanted to say that people think of FPGAs as these things that only come in data centers, but FPGAs come in all types of sizes, including Teeny. And this is another project to get you to contribute to my stuff. Um, this is called the Tomu project, and we have an FPGA, um, and it fits inside your USB port. Um, it has an ICE40 UP5K um, internally, and you can run a RISC-V CPU in your USB port, which can then run Python in your USB port. Um, and it has a fully open source tool chain end to end, um, as I mentioned. So um, you can go there, you can purchase them. I also have uh, some of the hacker boards here to give away. Um, the kind of deal is I won't accept money, but I do accept pull requests. Um, so, um, or you can order them from Sean, who's up the back um, on Proud Supply, and he takes money. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's the Tomu project and an FPGA which fits inside your USB port. Thank you. Looks like we have a question. That was 165 slides. <laughs> okay, this question isn't just for the Tomu, but for the uh, I ICE 5K. What's the most advanced Risk 5 on it? Like, can you boot Linux on it? Um, Zobs has a theory that he can make it work. Um, we will see if that's possible. Um, you're probably not going to boot Linux, a useful Linux, on 
the ICE 40. But you can definitely boot Linux on an RTX 7 or a ECP5 board. The ECP5 already has an open source toolchain. Um, the RTX 7 will very soon have a open source toolchain, and we're definitely targeting like Linux being the example demo application on a risk like a 32-bit risk V type system. Um, and so, yeah, there's plenty of open source boards out there, and they're probably going to get a lot more now that there's open tool chains for these parts. We just need the Debian guy to get his act up so we can get all fun stuff on it. Yes, which is why I asked about 32-bit um, stuff. Uh, we'd love help with that if you're interested in helping support 32-bit Linux and Debian. I'm sure um, you could get some hardware from me for that, um, even if you only just started. So when we see this conference on the internet, it's your hardware that's doing it? Yes. And where is your, where's the box? Is that over there? There's or? a box here that's doing the recording. Um, there's also a somewhat slightly damaged board up the back that I'm uh, showing as like, you can pick it up and have a look. It's a Spun and Six based FPGA. Um, there's also a NETV2 um, board up there that you can have a look. Um, that's an RTX 7 based FPGA. Um, there's also um, a couple of the dev boards, like a tiny FPGA BX, which is one of the ones that we support, and some uh, FOMUs up on the table back there. Um, if you want to see more, come and talk to me, and I'll show you some more, um, or talk to Sean. Um, Sean is giving out some of the uh, failed boards. If you want a really cool looking earring or bracelet or something. Um, they are very, very cool looking. Um, I'd highly recommend them. Uh, Sean is much better at doing production hardware than I am. Um, mine don't have ESD protection. So if you care about that, get a production one from Sean. Give him money. No more questions. Well, let's thank the speaker again.